under, you know, you saw the content. If you have a question about how many you've missed, Marlene Walls can help you with that. 20 seconds. If you don't know who she is, talk to me afterwards. I'll be here. <laughs> when you have a question, remember to press the button on the front of your microphone so that Ten the world can hear your question. Good afternoon and welcome to Purdue University and the Serious uh, Security Seminar. Our speaker today for this last Wednesday of this spring semester is Christine Task. She is a PhD student here working with Professor Chris Clifton and her research areas are differential privacy text analysis and social network analysis. Her topic today is a practical beginner's guide to differential privacy. Christine? Hi. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background for this talk. Um, my research is in differential privacy, and constantly I'm in the position of, uh, I go to a poster session or to discuss privately releasing some data with some people who have it. I approach them and I say, have you ever heard of differential privacy? Have you ever heard of differential privacy? Yes? No? <coughs> I get the most interesting answer to this question. The answer I get is usually sort of. I've kind of heard of it. I, I think I know how that works, but you're going to have to refresh it. And I do. And then if I run into the same person a couple months later, invariably, I say, so, differential privacy. And they're like, I sort of know about that. So what we're going to try and do is demystify differential privacy. Now, it turns out these people that are having trouble getting a good conceptual grasp on it, it's not their fault. Uh, the research domain as a whole is having some difficulty getting a good conceptual grasp on it. And in fact, in the past year, there have been a couple papers published totally pointing out underlying assumptions of differential privacy that people hadn't noticed, and things that they had been stating that were they were sort of overstating. So we're going to go over that. Uh, this is a messy area, but today it's going to be simple. It's going to be easy. It's going to be the sort of thing that you want to see on Dead Week. Here we go. Easy outline. What? How? Where? What? You're handed a survey. It asks about, you know, your age, your gender, what your taste is, and, you know, music with respect to Justin Bieber. Bieber? I don't know. Bieber. Bieber. There we go. <laughs> now we know my taste. Um, the researcher collects the data, says that they're going to put it into a data set, they're going to do some analysis, they'll privatize it, and of course they're not collecting your name, and they're going to release the results. What do you do? Do you submit your data? Are you worried that that will out you as somebody who likes Justin Bieber? Bieber? Okay, so first of all, the notation. Um, we're doing this survey in some population that we are studying, some defined population. We'll call that POP. We're distributing surveys, and only a certain amount of them get collected. Only I, people in POP, decide that they want to go ahead and give their information. The information given by person I is DI. The whole data set is big D, big I. That's the data set that was collected over the people in I. We're going to run some query, Q, on DI, and we're going to get a result, R. Q is going to be our analysis on the data set. Obviously, the, uh, and R is our privatized result. We're going to use R for what happens after we find the answer and we add whatever noise or whatever else we're going to do to privatize things. Okay, then the results are released to the public. That's the notation. What would make you feel safe handing in your survey? Would you feel safe if you knew that your answer would have no impact on the results? Probably, right? Would you feel safe if you knew that any attacker looking at the published results couldn't learn any new information about you personally? Maybe you would have some effect, but the, the attacker wouldn't be able to tell that. Why can't we get those? And I don't mean in differential privacy, I mean in general. First off, if an individual had no impact on the released results, the results would have no utility. The first person would have no impact, the second person would have no impact. The result you ended up with is the one you started with. Okay, we can't do that. Second of all, even if we only release aggregate results about the data set, even if the attacker can't tell that you participated at all, that your DI is in there at all, they can still learn things about you. For 
instance, if everybody in the population likes Justin Bieber, there is a high probability that you do too. Even worse, what happens if the attacker knows some function of you with respect to the aggregate results? For instance, they know your age is very, you know, exactly the average, exactly twice the average age, or they know that your gender is in the minority gender. So now, when I release my aggregate results about the population, I know you are a male 28-year-old in a population that likes Josh Bieber. I can find this amusing. Um, and this happens, note though, that this happens even if I don't submit my survey. Even if I don't submit information, these are conclusions that are being drawn on for me from the aggregate inf information. Okay, so we can't promise that the data won't ref uh, affect results. We can't promise that an attacker won't be able to learn new information about me from looking at the aggregate results, even if I don't submit my data. What can we do? This is what we're going to do. If I knew the chance the privatized release result would be R was nearly the same whether or not I released my information. So in other words, if I knew the answer that was going to be given to the public, if it's, well, if I knew it was likely to be R, whether or not I gave my information, then I could feel safe. There was a, a close thing in the probability. We'll show this with pictures here. We're getting to the messy part. Okay. So, mathematically what we're saying is that the probability that Q over the data set, the true data set, equaling R, is very close to the probability of Q over the data set plus or minus one person, equaling R. What does that mean? That means this. That means the chance that the result R, oh, I know I have a mouse in here. There it is. The chance that the result R came from the world, the possible world in which I submitted the survey versus the possible world where I didn't submit the survey is very similar. Both worlds have a similar probability of producing R. Given R, I can't really trace back and figure out which world it came from. Given R, I don't know whether or not I submitted a survey. Questions on this? Give me nods if this seems to make sense. There's at least two nods. Okay. One of them I explained to this before, though, so. Um, okay, so this is, this is what we're founding on. We're saying that We'll show exactly how we're going to do that in a moment. But first of all, look at some things that we did not just say. We did not just say that if an attacker can't tell whether or not you submitted a survey, they can't learn anything about you from the results. Why didn't we say that? It's the same thing we pointed out at the beginning. It doesn't matter whether or not you submitted a survey, I can still learn things about you from the aggregate results, possibly. Okay. Another thing we did not say, we did not say that an attacker can't possibly guess with high probability whether or not I took the survey. We said that the world where I took the survey and the world that I didn't both had a similar probability of producing that answer. So from that answer, it's hard to guess which world you're in. But we're only uh, caring about worlds that differ in one individual. What happens if I have some buddies? So if I always do the same thing as my six best friends, then the world where all seven of us take the survey is going to be different, going to have a, a different probability distribution of results than the world where all seven of us didn't. If I know that I'm an attacker, if I know that I am looking at a world where all seven people took the survey, then I'm going to say, well, there's a very good chance you took the survey. Okay? You are protected for your individual decisions. Groups are not protected. So, specifically, what does differential privacy do? It gives you an incredibly strict, rigorous protection of personally identifiable information. In fact, it protects all personal information that goes into the data set. As long as you're only providing information about yourself and nobody else is providing information about you, which is the default setting. 
However, it does not protect you from having conclusions drawn about you from the aggregate results. Just like any data mining, any sort of research, any sort of study, the researcher needs to consider the ethics of releasing the results. Even if you can't tell that an individual is in the group, if you release something that's invasive about the group, you need to be careful about that. But that's the same as what you always need to do. And it does not protect uh, attackers from learning information about cohesive groups that are known to exist. So again, if we know that the distribution of our population is in clumps of people and their best buddies, if we imagine the population is over sororities, for instance, or fraternities, some group of people that's large and may tend to act in a similar way along some question, line of questions, then we know that this, we need to consider that, right? Um, conclusions may be drawn about those groups. We need to consider about the ethics of releasing the results. But again, this is normally what you do in research. What differential privacy does is it provides a rigorous guarantee of individual information. Okay. How does it do it? Well, we'll go back to our survey. We want to get nearly the same distribution of answers from both possible worlds. How do we do that? How do we bridge the gap? If I submit the survey, it's going to say that 38 people liked Bieber. If I didn't submit the survey, it's going to say that 37 people did. I need to come up with a result that is likely to have come from either possibility. So let's look at exactly measuring that gap that we need to worry about. The global sensitivity of a function is the maximum difference in answers that adding or removing any individual from the data set can cause. So intuitively, this is the worst case scenario. If I add somebody, this is the maximum amount my answers are going to change. And if I'm asking multiple questions, I sum the differences. Okay. So, for example, in the previous, um, in the previous case, if X people like Bieber, and I add or uh, remove one person, we're going to have at most a change of X plus one people like Bieber. Right? Possibly X minus one people like Bieber. So the gap there is one. Sensitivity is one. That's the gap we need to span. Good. Okay. Histograms that partition the data so that each individual can show up in only one bucket are a nice cheat. So if I ask how many males and females are there in the data set, and there are M males and F females, then when I add or remove one person, we're going to default for add here, then I'm going to be either adding one male or adding one female. One person will not cause both counts to increase. Therefore, the total sensitivity, the total maximum change across the two questions is one. In fact, that's going to be true for any histogram, any count that partitions the data set like that. And that's going to be incredibly useful. Okay. What if I want to do both? I want to know how many people I've, I've collected this data. I would like to use all of it. I want to say, how many people like Bieber? How many males are there? How many females are there? Okay. Um, note that that's going to change by the number of people that like Bieber, if I add, for instance, a guy who likes Bieber, that's going to change the first count by one and one of the second two counts by one, total change of two. Sensitivity is two. I've asked two questions. Each had a sensitivity of one. My total sensitivity is two. OK. Note, by the way, that I, I didn't connect those, right? I could also have made it how many women like Justin Bieber, how many men like Justin Bieber, how many women don't like Justin Bieber, how many men don't like Justin Bieber. What would the sensitivity have that been? Question to the audience. Does, does nobody ever ask questions to the audience here? But they may not get answered. Zero. <laughs> it's a sensitivity of one, OK? If I partition my data set into four groups, girls that like Bieber, boys that like Bieber, girls that don't like Bieber, boys that like don't like Bieber, then adding one person, one person is only going to adjust the count in one of those buckets by at most one. Okay. What's the total number of Bieber albums owned by people in the data set? So now people can own multiple um, Bieber, album, Bieber albums. So adding one person 
you know, having one extra person take a survey is going to increase the count by possibly more than one. Does anybody know what the worst case on this is? Anybody know? I had to look this up on Wikipedia this morning. He has apparently published three studio albums. Okay. So the worst case scenario is adding one person, there's going to be three more albums to our total count. Okay. So for brownie points, if I wanted to ask all three questions, I'd have a total sensitivity of five. Okay. What's the gap between the oldest and youngest members of the data set? So if the oldest person is 50 and the youngest person is 13, I'm going to give myself an easy one, 10, then the gap is 40, right? So how does that gap change if I add or remove somebody? We have no idea. Unless we want to start like knocking people off at a certain age, 110 and you're done. Um, we, we don't know. This is not a defined question. And, and we'll talk about how to deal with that in data like age data sort of towards the end of the, the talk. But things are not always as simple as you'd like them to be. Okay, how do we bridge that gap? We bridge that gap with Laplacian noise. Laplacian noise looks like that big diagram. Um, as the standard deviation increases, so it has a, um, with a low standard deviation, which is what we will need to, to bridge a gap of, say, sensitivity 1, the red line there is a good sign of the sort of noise we would add for a sensitivity of 1. Um, you can see that it stays very close to the original answer. It stays very close to adding zero noise. There's a high probability that it's going to add a small amount of noise. And you'll note that this is much more focused than um, Gaussian noise would be. So this is convenient. Um, obviously, as the standard deviation increases, right, as we move on towards that, the blue line here is a standard deviation of 5, parameter 5. That's the sort of noise we would be looking at if we were going to ask all four questions. There, we're looking at noise values of minus 8, positive 10. So at that point, I had better ask a lot of people whether or not they like Justin Bieber if I want my results to be useful. Okay? But we still have, if I just want to do a histogram and break things into buckets, then I can still use very small noise. So there's tricks to reduce the sensitivity of what you're doing. Now, how exactly does this noise work? It works like this. Remember the possible worlds. Okay? So here we have the rainstorm at the bottom is um, all these possible worlds that could be the case. These are all the possible data sets we could be looking at. One has John, one doesn't have Mary, and so on. And <clears throat> we see what happens is when we add that Laplacian noise, the noise that um, is added to each answer overlaps. The, you know, the, the distribution of results for each answer, the distribution of noisy results for each answer heavily overlaps the distribution from its neighbors. So, for instance, if I return this result r, you see that that r might have come from d2, because d2 has a good chance of producing that value. It might have come from d1. D1's got a pretty good chance of producing that value. D3's got a small chance, but it's there. Same thing with d0. And in fact, you can imagine d50 has a very tiny, but still technically possible chance of producing that answer. So it's very likely that the answer we get is going to be in the neighborhood of the true answer. We'll get the neighborhood. The set, you know, we know that it's somewhere in the D0, D3 region. But we're not going to know which specific world it is. And which, since we don't know what specific world it is, we don't know whether or not any individual in the data set participated, whether any individual was in the data set. Here's the proof. So you might possibly have noticed um, the incredibly ugly e to the epsilon. Right, the value on the top of that fraction there is a chance of getting R if we're looking at data set I. And the, chance, uh, the thing on the bottom is the chance of getting result R if we're looking at I plus or minus some dude. Okay? That makes sense, right? We want, if we, if we want those two values to be close to each other, we want that value to be close to 1. But we didn't say we wanted it to be close to 1. We said we wanted it to be close to e to the epsilon, which is usually the exact point in differential privacy where people's eyes glaze over. But there's a reason for it. It's because combined with Laplacian um, noise, it actually makes the math 
really easy, but nobody ever shows you the math so you don't know. So we're going to show you the math now, and you can see why we're doing this. First of all, we plug in our little function we just pulled from up above, which is the chance of getting R, given that the real world is D, and the sensitivity is delta F, and our epsilon, which is our little component that controls how close to one we are, um, is epsilon. So this is exactly what happens when we, this is the chance of getting R given that we're adding Laplacian noise to the data. Okay? We've plugged that in. Um, you may notice that on the left side of the fraction, we have the same thing on both the top and the bottom. We will get rid of that. Okay, now we're looking at this. You may notice that we have e to the something over e to the something else. But remember, it's dealing with exponents. Okay, so we go ahead and we take e and we subtract the bottom from the top. Since the bottom was negative, this means we end up adding it. This is what it looks like. Okay, we now notice that those two things in the sum have an epsilon and a uh, delta F, sensitivity of F. So we'll take that out. And we'll also go ahead and combine that since R minus F of D1 and R minus F of, R minus F of DI and R minus F of DI plus or minus one, I, it's terrible for speaking, okay, it can be collapsed down like this. And now this is what we're looking at. And guess what? If you've been paying attention, and it's dead weak, and I forgive you if you haven't, but if you've been paying attention, we're basically done now. Right? Because remember, the delta F is the maximum difference we can get between the function on any two neighboring data sets. And the thing we have over on the right there is the difference between two specific data sets, and the thing we have on the bottom there is delta F, so what we get is this. e to the epsilon times a, where a is going to be less than 1. And we're done. Just basic algebra. It all comes out nicely. So that's why we have e to the epsilon. We could have just write that as a and said a next to 1, but we're doing it like this. OK. Give it a try. So now, comprehension questions. I will applaud anybody who actually responds. How do you privatize a histogram with three partitions? What do you need to do about adding noise to that? I've given you a moment to contemplate it. What you do is you add a noise of sensitivity 1, because remember, histograms have sensitivity 1. You add a noise of sensitivity 1 to each partition. Okay? So each answer you're given, you think of each bucket in the histogram as being a separate answer. So male is one bucket and female is another. And you add a noise of 1 to each. Okay. How do you privatize a series of five overlapping counts across a data set? So for instance, overlapping counts are things that one person can participate in multiple counts. Like if I was going to count how many people in the data are female, how many like Justin Bieber, how many are in the age range 12 to 16, these are all overlapping counts. If I was going to ask, because one person could be a female who liked Justin Bieber and was 14. How much they overlap? No, you're just going to assume that if one person could, because remember we're doing worst case. So if one person could possibly contribute to all of the counts, and there's five counts, then how much could adding one person to the data set change things? Five. By five. Right. Um, as promised. Okay. Uh, yeah, the data set could change by five, right? One person who was a female who liked Justin Bieber, who was 14, who had red hair and lived in Ohio, if we were asking those questions, would increase all five of those counts. And therefore, their total effect on our uh, query, those five counts, would be five. We have the noise. We need to add that noise to all of our queries. And so we would add a noise of five to all five questions which means I had better be talking to a lot of people in Ohio. Um, okay. What if I want to privatize an interactive query? 
So what I'm talking about here is, first, someone's going to ask me a question about the data. And I'm going to, private, I'm going to give them a privatized answer. Then they're going to ask me another question based on the answer from that first question. And we're going to say that both of these questions are counts over the data. What would it be if I asked them both at the same time? If I could look into the future and say these are the two questions you're going to ask. It would be two, because I'm, I'm checking two counts. So it would be a noise of one for each, a total of two. Okay? So making it interactive actually doesn't matter. What I need to do is say you only get two questions, and if I add or remove one person from the data set, it's going to change both of those questions' answers by at most one, and my total sensitivity is going to be two. Okay. So I need to sort of look into the future, say you're only allowed to ask X questions, and then I'm going to add a noise of X to all of the answers. Right, if I'm asking two questions, I'll add a noise calibrated to sensitivity 2 to both of the questions, and then I cut them off. So this is not a mechanism for releasing continuous privatized answers about a data set, and this makes sense, because if you wanted to, for instance, um, find out exactly how many people like Justin Bieber, you could ask me. And then you could ask me again, and then you could ask me again, and then you could ask me again, and then you could take all of those answers and average the noise. And because the noise is symmetric, you, you could average all the answers. And because the noise is symmetric, um, with some number of questions, you would get the correct answer. Which is why we don't let you do that. We say, you only get to ask me two questions, and if you want them both to be how many people like Justin Bieber, I'm going to be adding twice as much noise, right, to both of them. And so if you get both of those answers and you average them, you're going to get twice as much of half as much noise. You're going to get the appropriate amount of noise. Okay? This prevents you from abusing the system. Okay. How do you privatize a query whose sensitivity depends on the number of people in the data set? So for instance, mean. Mean is an incredibly tricky one. Right? Um, or how many friends do you have that also took the survey? So what's interesting, how many friends do you all have that also took the survey? Well, in the worst case, the number of friends you have that took the survey is everyone. You're friends with everyone who took the survey. Well, how many people took the survey? Well, we're not allowed to say, right? Globally, what's the worst case on that? Can I say that I'm going, we'll, we'll get to this. Um, it's in, and in is unbounded. Um, so strictly speaking, these things have unbounded sensitivity. We see the problem with mean? Because remember, we're looking at the worst case scenario. So let's say I'm taking an average across a data set with one person in it. Okay, so that person has three albums from Justin Bieber. There's only one person in the data set. I say my average is three. Now in the possible world next door, that person was like, eh, I don't want to fill this thing out. And now I'm dividing by zero, basically. Um, and so here, this is, this is essentially undefined. And I have a gap that's undefined. So you can't just do mean like that. Median's even worse. Um, and you can't do these sort of graph degree questions where you're saying, how many friends do you have in a set? If you don't know how many people are in the set, if the set of people who are surveyed could be as large as possible, you know, or the set of people in the population could be as large as possible, then I don't have any way of setting an upper bound on that. I don't have any way of defining the sensitivity. Unless I do. So what you can do instead is you can say, all right, look, we're not going to privatize how many people filled out the survey. We're going to make that public knowledge. We're going to say, all right, we're protecting these people, but we are going to say that there were 12 people that did this. But we're going to protect the content of their data, all their parameters. So what we do now is we consider neighboring worlds, instead of having one person not take, out, not take the survey, we have one person completely change their answers. And we see how much that can change the, uh, the results. So for instance, um, if somebody looking at the number of Justin Bieber albums 
right? We can say that we definitely know there were 30 people who filled out this survey. And we know that if one person changes their answer from three albums to zero albums, the whole total is going to shift by at most three. Okay, so those are my two neighboring worlds. And now I can't tell how many albums an individual had. I'm protecting their parameters. Um, and we just go ahead and we can release the, the number of individuals in the data set. So now we have a number that we can use as the denominator of mean or whatever else we want to do. And this is a variant on differential privacy. Okay. Okay. Breaking things and fixing things. Here are, if you ever, if somebody ever hands you a paper in differential privacy and says, your, your advisor does this and says, I need you to do a, a peer review of this to see if it gets accepted to some conference. These are the things you need to pay attention to. Okay, so first of all, just a, a practical thing. How do you privatize data whose range is unknown, like ages of people who like Justin Bieber? So um, one approach to that is to use a histogram. And you can go ahead, if you don't know the, the range, because um, we use histograms for everything, if you don't know the range, you can go ahead and have a bucket at the end that says older than 45, or everything else goes here. That's okay, now we're safe again. It only has a sensitivity of one. But we are only sort of safe. Um, there are things to be careful about when you're using histograms, too. For instance, if you spread the data across too many buckets, right? If instead of having five-year age gaps, I went for every single year, what's going to happen? The results in each bucket, the counts in each bucket, are going to be small. Maybe there's only three people who were 15. Or there's only two people who were 32. OK? And then the noise that I'm adding to each bucket is going to totally eclipse those answers. My, my information is going to become meaningless. So what you want to do is use larger buckets. You want to collect things into buckets um, that are likely to be well populated. Another thing you want to worry about. Okay, let's say that um, you know that you have, let's say that instead of cutting off at greater than 45, let's say instead what I did was I kept going 45 to 55, 55 to 65, 65 to 75, and I, I was like greater than 110 was my leftover bucket. Now the problem with doing this is I have lots of buckets that are going to be empty. And maybe all the data is nicely coalesced down around the, the teenage years. And so those buckets are going to be robust to getting noise. They're, they're going to survive getting noise added to them. And who cares about what happens to the empty buckets, right? But the more buckets you have, the more chances, the more times you have to draw noise from that Laplacian distribution. And the more times you have to draw noise, the greater the probability that one of those noise values is going to be ridiculously huge or ridiculously small, right? Remember that distribution had a small chance of producing answers that were very different from the real answer. So you don't want to have lots of empty buckets hanging around, right? You want to have just the right buckets. You want to get small buckets around areas where data is likely to be dense and you want to have a few you know, buckets, broad buckets around areas where data is going to be likely less, more sparse and less interesting. And then you want to stop. But when you're doing this, you can't use actual statistics about the data to choose your uh, bucket ranges. And why not? Because that's another query. You would have to privatize it too. Now you can use privatized statistics about your data to choose your bucket ranges, but by the time you've gotten done doing that, you're adding a lot of queries, you may be ask, adding a lot of noise to the data. That's a problem. Okay, so what you have to do is use common sense. Or if there is a publicly available data set that you can use that would be similar to base your, your estimates on, you can do that. How can I make sure my results will still have utility after I've added noise? This is the, uh, this is the worst offenders area. Check the sensitivity. When you get done figuring out how much noise is going to need to be added to privatize your query, make sure that it hasn't completely obliterated the query. It's very easy in a paper to write down a variable, say this is, you know, the sensitivity is going to be n times k over whatever, but go through and figure out what that's actually going to be, what your expected data counts, data values are going to be, and make sure it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, find ways of getting what you want by asking fewer questions from the data. This is often possible. 
Another thing you can do is look at post-processing. So we've said that sometimes it's possible pulling from Laplace and noise to get ridiculous values, right? There's a very small chance that you're going to get an answer that has a high amount of noise that's going to be very different from the true answer. In fact, you can even get negative answers um, for small things. So what you can do is go ahead and once you have the privatized data, you can clip off anything that doesn't make sense. And you can actually map it over to the nearest possible world that does make sense, okay? So if I say, 33.2 people like Justin Bieber, I can go ahead and release 33 people like Justin Bieber. And that has actually been shown to improve results. Okay, finally be careful about how you're using them. Do not stick a noisy count in the bottom of a mean. A lot of people are like, oh, means, averages. We're just going to count up how many total albums there are, privatize that. We're going to count up how many people there are, privatize that, we're going to divide the top by the bottom. But what happens when the denominator of a mean changes? Now you're changing your total, your, your answer by like factors of magnitude. The, you know, if you add one or two or three, you're, you're going to be having a very large effect on your end result. So when you go to use noisy counts, make sure you're using them in functions that aren't sensitive to it. And generally avoid dividing by it. Okay, anything else you should be careful about? Be careful about privacy leaks. You're going along doing data mining, and you're like, okay, this is great, common sense, we're just going to go count the most common uh, words in this data set, and we're going to add some noise, and you know, then we're going to release some, it'll be a, you know, it'll be a nice little set of counts. Um, anytime you might be tempted to pull words or specific information or use non-privatized statistics about the data to go ahead and run your algorithm, that's a problem. The only time you touch the data has got to be through a differentially privatized query. So if you have to have a list of words, if you're counting the frequency of words, you can't find the words in the data set. You have to find the words someplace else that are likely to be in the data set, or they have to be public knowledge, like these are the items being sold in this grocery store or something, and then you can go ahead and use that. Okay, now that we know what we're doing and how we are doing it, where do we do it? Where does it get, where does it get used? Where does it get used? So uh, first of all, histograms and counts are easy, like we've said. And this is just going to be a very brief sort of annotated bibliography just to show you some of the things that get done out there. <clears throat> so you can do binary decision trees, okay? You want to use, uh, you can select just a few parameters, use a few partitionings, do your counts, and actually with some very good accuracy, you can build binary decision classifiers. Differentially private. You can actually do uh, network trace analysis. You can look at how people in a network are uh, using the network, find patterns of behavior and, and, and clustering and things like that. You do that by um, counting the number of messages that go from node to node and then privatizing those counts. Um, <clears throat> another case, these examples are sort of graph oriented because that's my area, um, but there was this little bit of a fuss you might have heard about, maybe, when AOL released some search results a few years back, if you remember this. It was a huge amount of fuss. Like, people got sued, it was terrible. So these people went and showed how you can actually do this safely. You collect pairs where an individual enters in a query and clicks on, you know, the favorite result. And then you can privatize those counts. So if somebody types in Facebook, always clicks on the Facebook link, that's a pretty tight connection. You're going to see a lot of counts there. Even after you privatize it, you'll know that's probably the best uh, result to return for that query. Okay, that's what we can do with counts. But Although this talk hasn't really led you to believe that, there's a lot of things we can do besides counts, too. Some very intricate, messy things. Uh, one of my favorite is uh, k-core clustering. So this is where you have individuals mapped as points in some parameter space. Um, or you can just think of this as, you know, points across a plane, and we want to form them into groups. Actually, in dimensional space, but we want to, we want to form them into groups. And so what we can do um, is actually for each one of those clusters, we can represent it by a smaller set of artificially chosen points 
whose distribution is not likely to be affected by adding or removing somebody. So you can imagine these points exist and sort of sum up the information. They're robust to small changes. They, they represent sort of conceptually the clusters more meaningfully than just anything that could be varied by an individual person. There's the paper, feel free to look it up. Um, frequent item set mining is another thing. It's incredibly interesting. This is what happens when you scan your Kroger's card. The uh, grocery store collects all this information. They say, you bought these things together, you bought those things together, and then they know to stick the peanut butter next to the jelly or whatever else that they want to find out. And uh, frequent item set mining looks for subsets. This is a very clever way of doing it because it's easy to do lots and lots of counts in frequent item set mining, which would break privacy. But they do some very clever subsampling of things to reduce the number of counts that need to be done. Generally, in differential privacy, what I should have mentioned at the beginning but didn't, um, Cynthia Dork uh, at Microsoft Research is the person who invented this. And she's awesome, and her papers are awesome, and uh, worth, worth working through, actually. And then Frank McSherry has also done a lot with it. Um, so there's Cynthia Dwork's survey, and this is where I started, and it's not a bad starting place. Um, <clears throat> if you wanted to look at some of the recent papers, they're looking at some of those underlying assumptions we mentioned back at the beginning. Um, no free lunch and data privacy, and uh, towards privacy for social network with a zero-knowledge based definition of privacy, look more deeply at what we're doing with differential privacy. And that's it. We've got nine minutes for questions if anyone has them. Yeah. So it looks like you calculate the noise based on the number of uh, sets of data that the query is going to touch. And so mm -hmm. the addition of noise is actually based on the data returned to the, to the querier. Why, why would you... Um, why would you base noise on queries instead of just adding noise to the data set and releasing the data set for, for people to query on their own time? So you can do that. In fact, actually, that's basically what KCore uh, clustering is doing. And there are some other things that do that. The main, prob main problem is that what do you mean by a data set? Because if I'm going to hide the existence of individuals in the data set, then if I want to privatize it according to differential privacy and release that, I can't end up with the same sort of individuals I had going in because any person has to be able to deny being there. But what I can do is come up with a sort of reduced abstraction of the data and then release that and people can play with that. Uh, another case where you see that done is um, graph modeling. So we'll collect, and there's different ways to privatize uh, graphs with differential privacy. But what you can do is privatize a couple statistics like the degree distribution and maybe the number of triangles and then you can use that to build new graphs that have similar properties to the original and then you can release those graphs and people can go ahead and study them. Um, but it's not just like being able to remove somebody's name from the data set, right? With differential privacy so that each person can deny having been there or for some reason claim to be in the data set when they weren't if they wanted to. Um, you have to, you, you can't release like line for line, person for person, the, the original data set in any form, so. So it's effectively like trying to anticipate all of the queries and covering all of those while still preserving privacy? Essentially. Trying to make it so that no matter when I, if I release the, uh, if I privatize the data set in some form and then release that, anything anybody asks, um, they can't be able to tell whether a given person was in the data set. So. Any other? Yeah, I was thinking.